أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان. so this surah Rahman is the mercy and blessing of Allah and the first thing that Allah Taala describes. <coughs> about the characteristic of Rahman, the characteristic of mercy and kindness is that he gave us the knowledge of the Qur'an. So this Qur'an is a treasure of infinite value which the Muslims don't appreciate. Allah al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan, so he created us, this is another favor of Allah, and then Allah al-Bayan, he taught us how to talk. Now this is again a, another great favor of Allah in the sense that, see, um, try learning a language now and you will find out. <laughs> Babies are given the gift from Allah of the ability to learn language. Now you try to learn a foreign language and it's the most difficult, much more difficult than learning economics. But as a baby who has no power to do anything, you, you can learn any complicated language that you like <coughs> without any difficulty. So this is Allah Ta'ala teaching us. <coughs> also there is a secret. If you are going to deliver a talk or something, then just recite this surah Allah Bayan and ask Allah Ta'ala to teach you how to talk and He will give you the words that you need for the occasion. <coughs> So today we will talk more about building models and one very important thing that uh, what you are taught about what models are is systematically wrong and deceptive. Actually a model is all about the assumptions, that's where your center of attention should be. What are the things that you are assuming? Now in the traditional way the assumptions are made sort of in a hurry and routinely that this doesn't matter. It's the calculations which matter, which is completely opposite of the truth. So, for example, when we are learning econometric, we say, oh, these are the assumptions of the <coughs> regression model. Everybody memorize them, and then you go on to the analysis. And you never mention, are these assumptions ever true or false? This is never discussed. Actually, the whole thing is assumptions. So, basically, you have assumptions, and then you have data, and then you combine them, and you get conclusions. So now you are told, without any discussion of the assumptions, that the data tells us this. This is completely wrong. Actually it's the assumptions which are telling us that, not the data. And you can prove this easily by changing the assumptions and getting different results. And I've done this many times. Even exactly the same data sets, by making one set of assumptions you can get one conclusion, by making another set of assumptions you can get the opposite conclusion. The whole thing is in the assumptions, but in the Western methodology, they don't talk about assumptions, they talk about the data. <coughs> so, models is all about making assumptions. And so, what are the assumptions that mean? This is the 100% that we need to concentrate on. So, in the um, Western economic theory, you make ridiculous assumptions, one after the other. So now, uh, we've already discussed how the supply and demand model is wrong, but um, this model is at the heart of modern economic theory, and it's completely wrong. And uh, the problem is that both supply and demand come from the same factors, and therefore you can't separate them. And Keynes realized this. Basically, see, uh, he realized that in depression you have low aggregate demand. Why is aggregate demand low? Because the workers don't have jobs. Why don't the worker have jobs? Because the suppliers think that the demand is low. So it's a cycle and uh, you can break it. You can break the cycle. He said that if the government just gives jobs to uh, people, one set of people dig ditches and the other set of people comes and fills in the ditches. <laughs> and so it's completely useless. 
But uh, you pay them money. Now these people will go to the market and start buying things. When they start buying things, then the producer will know, oh, there's demand. When there's demand, then they will start giving jobs. When they start giving jobs, then there will be more demand. And so this cycle will bring you back to supposedly equilibrium. <coughs> So let the government create useless jobs or let them just drop money by helicopter and that will have the same effect. It will create the demand that is missing and once the demand is there then the jobs will be created. So it's a the supply and demand are both dependent on the same thing and so they, they don't act independently. That's why the <coughs> um, economic uh, story of supply and demand is wrong. Now, the second most important thing to understand is that a model is designed to help us understand the complex reality. It's not designed to make something easy to understand more difficult, which is how you are taught. That's why we build simple models, because we can understand simple models. And so we try to model a very complex reality in a simple way so that we can understand it. The whole job of the model is to be understood. It has to be understood by the heart, not... Uh, by calculations and piece of paper. So uh, now I am going to build a model <coughs> and one of my goals is to keep the model close to the new classical so that we can compare. So that requires a lot of tricks because the new classical is not easy to, the new classical model is very far from reality. So how to make it come close to reality is difficult but I've done it in this and I've shown so first we build the demand part of the model. So we have the same agricultural model as before that you are familiar with. You have a landlord, he has a piece of land. On this piece of land he will hire labor. Uh, the labor can be used to produce wheat or cotton. We assume that they are interchangeable. So you have 10 units of productive capacity and in this 10 units you can produce either wheat or cotton and these are freely converted to bread and clothes. So. Uh, manufacturing industry is not there. <coughs> so this is just simplifications. So this part is easy to understand. Everybody understands, right? Now let's put in just to try to match uh, um, neoclassical. We put in Cobb Douglas demand function. So the utility for bread and clothes is B to the alpha and C to the beta. Bread to the alpha. This is standard Cobb Douglas utility function. This uh, will lead to the demand of the ith consumer. So, what is the demand function? We maximize subject to the budget constraints. M money is equal to the price of bread times bread plus the price of cotton times cotton. Now, all of your economic theory is trying to teach you how you solve this problem. But, how you solve this problem is trivial and unimportant and uh, actually uh, you should just feed this to the computer to get the answer out. I mean, that's not where the ball game is. The ball game is to understand, okay, these are the assumptions, the utility function. The so what is the solution? I've given the solution details in, in the notes, but the solution is very nice and elegant. It's uh, pretty. Uh, the price of bread times bread should equal alpha over alpha plus beta times M, and the price of cotton times cotton should be beta over alpha plus beta times M. What this means is that the budget share, the amount of money you spend on bread, is a fixed proportion of the total income. And the amount of money you spend on <coughs> cotton is also a fixed share. So this is a constant budget share model. Alpha then measures, alpha and beta measure, measure your preference for bread versus uh, cotton. If they are the same, then you uh, divide your budget 50-50. If alpha is 1 and beta is 4, then you put 4 times as much, much money into the cotton and so on. So, very simple solution. <coughs> now, the next step is the one that economics doesn't teach you. It is that we take this theoretical solution and match it to reality. Is this really what happens? So, one thing that actually it does match is that we have mental accounting models, people have studied how people behave and they find that contrary to neoclassical theory, people make budgets in different categories. So this is against new, new classical because there is no different category, all money is the same, it's fungible. You can take from one and put to the other but 
it makes very complicated our own calculations to do that. So as a heuristic device, human beings do something very clever, which is that they split their budgets into different categories and say, okay, I'll spend this much money on food, this much money in housing, this is my tuition and books, and travel and miscellaneous expenses will come. And so you make your, this is how you make your budget. Then within the budget, you can interchange. So when you have food budget, you can buy whatever you like within that food budget. So now the Cap Douglas matches this prediction. We have a fixed budget for food and a fixed budget for clothing. This is good. So we have some match between our theory and reality. But uh, one thing that uh, economists don't do is that if there's no match, you should reject the theory, not the data. What the economists do is when they don't find a match, they reject the data <laughs> instead of the theory. So uh, one thing is true that, okay, this is a good, uh, that means automatically that this will not be true for subcategories. So if you want to make a uh, utility function for rice and wheat, then this would not be suitable because we would expect more substitution. Uh, so if um, within a category, the same budget will be applying to wheat and rice, so you will be doing more substitution. But for major categories, it's okay. Food and clothes are, are big categories and they can't substitute for each other, so we can think of having separate budgets. But there is something which is highly unrealistic about this function. So the demand function you can write by dividing both sides by the price and you get the demand for bread is alpha over alpha plus beta, m divided by price. So it's very nice. Uh, it's uh, the standard feature of being uh, linear in, in money and um, inversely proportional to price. And also it has this neutrality of money. If you double money and double prices, there is no change in the demand. But there is still something very wrong about this. What is that? Distribution ki toh baat hi nahi kare. Ek, ek, uh, constant share. Constant share is fine. Uh, I'm just talking about one consumer right now. One consumer, the bread you buy is exactly inversely proportional to price. The uh, larger the price, the less bread you buy, and the smaller the price, the more bread you buy. So what? There are there are actually two things that go wrong near the extremes. What are those? Necessity that is uh, that is there. Mm, that's the <coughs> that's the problem that <coughs> if the price of uh, wheat goes to 10,000 rupees per kg and your budget is 100 rupees then you will buy 10 grams no once uh, the price goes too high and the amount that you buy is just meaningless so if the price of rice is very high you will buy a few grains of rice that's nonsense so you won't buy it so <coughs> there should be a minimum acceptable quantity <coughs> and therefore a maximum acceptable price. If the price is too high, then it doesn't make sense to make buy a few grains of rice or uh, just a few grams of wheat which with which you can't do anything. <coughs> so there's a cutoff. It can't be that if price is a million dollars, you buy one over one millionth um, quantity of wheat. Um, there is a second thing that on the other end also if the price of uh, uh, wheat becomes free or nearly free then you will buy one million tons again that's not true <coughs> <coughs> so you should put an upper bound <coughs> but there is a more interesting uh, problem with um, making this as the utility function this comes from the realization that if you look at data, you find that the budget share for food declines as you uh, increase the income. And that's obvious and its uh, data shows that clearly. 
So for rich people spend a lot smaller proportion of their budget on food and poor people spend a lot of high proportion. So according to this model, what does that mean? Exactly. The, as the income increases, your preferences change. Uh, uh, alpha, the share of, oh, I've written the wrong, a uh, coefficient alpha must decrease as income increases, or beta must increase. So as, you're, as you become, as you have more income, your uh, utility function preferences change in the direction of clothes. Now this is possible, but it's uh, unlikely, and it's uh, not a good assumption to tie the utility function to the income. <coughs> also, it doesn't seem realistic. It seems that the people are the same. So, as you become richer, your preferences change is not uh, plausible according to our sense of how the world behaves. It's just that if you have more money, you don't need as much uh, food and you uh, diversify your expenditure. <coughs> so we can modify the model a little bit we say that there is a minimum amount of bread that is required to buy first you must buy this then you split the rest of the income uh, between the bread and cotton so now you say the utility function comes into operation after you fulfill your basic needs now this matches the data and everybody has the same utility function but the poor people spend most of their budget uh, acquiring their uh, basic need and the uh, rich people, it's, uh, uh, that's a very small amount, so it doesn't matter. You see, if you... <coughs> <coughs> Suppose I will, we will do that 33 units of bread, bread are required and it's 10 rupees per unit. So if somebody has 50 rupees, then he will spend 30% of his income on bread and then split <coughs> 20 rupees between cotton and bread. So he will have 40 units of consumption of bread and 10 units. If somebody has a thousand rupees of income, then again he will spend 30, first 30 units of, on bread, but now he will spend half of his income on bread and cotton, so about 500 rupees on cotton, 500 on bread. So uh, budget share of the <coughs> bread for the poor person is 30 out of 50 is 60 percent and uh, it's good declines to 50 percent in this model. <coughs> so um, instead of the utility function what we say is that okay this is how people will behave they will buy minimum required quantity of bread and then they will split the remaining income into some fixed proportion between bread and cotton according to their taste. So this, is, uh, this is almost like the utility function but uh, it has just one difference that we are putting in a basic necessity or a basic need first and then the utility function goes into operation. <coughs> so this is what models are like. Models are basically rules of thumb or how humans behave not the exact calculation of optima because actually human behavior is something that you and I understand. So <clears throat> uh, we should model human behavior in ways that we understand. So rough rules of thumb, this is what exactly the principle of agent based modeling is that you have simple rules of behavior which correspond to what we know about human beings. So this is against the variant optimization, but in this model we are matched almost. Uh, but it's uh, consistent with satisfying. But you see, when you are uh, making these models, you can say that, okay, 50-50, uh, but that's an approximate. I mean, human beings will not calculate to the last decimal place. They, as long as, I mean, if you have 11 units of income, you won't buy 5.5 .5 units of bread and 5.5 .5 units of clothing. You can buy five or six or even four and seven say, okay, that's roughly half and half. This is how humans behave, not like machines and robots and 
computers. So you have a rough idea, this is what I want to do, and then as long as things are closely in that direction, you say, okay, that's fine. So you go in with the idea that I want to buy a clothing for 3,000 rupees, and if it's 4,000, you buy it, and if it's 3,000, you buy it, and if it's 7,000, you don't. So according to these, we can put in a demand function, especially if you're going to do a calculation on of the model in, in computers or uh, programming, then you have to put in rules, because the computer cannot do fuzzy logic like we can. So you have to de de determine the rule, but you should understand that it's an approximate uh, approximation to human behavior. So here we say that, okay, there's a minimum budget, there's a, there's a B min, which is the smallest amount of bread that you will accept. After that, you will just abandon this category. So if the, um, if the price of buying the smallest unit is greater than your budget, M of I, then you don't demand anything. You can't buy your minimum requirement. So you just give up. Then behavior will change radically in this situation. Then you will go and steal or you will... Uh, by um, you will go to the jungle and get hunt for food or something like that but this will cannot come within the model because this is very um, <coughs> strange situation now as long as you can buy your minimum quantity then your um, bread demand is going to be your minimum which you have to buy and then you reduce the money required for, for the minimum from your money so mi minus pb times b min and then you just apply the Cobb Douglas utility function. So it's certain proportion of your income is devoted to this this purchase. Now on the cotton side, the cloth side, you have no minimum requirement. So you have this. You could also put in a minimum requirement for cotton as well if you wanted to. I'm just keeping things simple. Now, is this reasonable? Again, that means you match this to the data. And then if we think about this, well, it's much better than the original unmodified Cobb Douglas. Uh, for basic needs, there could also be a maximum consumption, after which you don't want more bread. Uh, there's only a limited amount that you can eat. But OK, let's bypass this. As I said, the uh, landlords have excess bread, so maybe they have huge parties every once in a while but, and they give gifts of clothing so we keep keep this picture out of the picture otherwise you could what really happens is that you could put in a luxury good for some sort of but we want to keep the model simple now uh, one of the things that the um, neoclassical teaches us which is what I used to believe until I made this model and I was so shocked when I understood that what is wrong. It took me quite a little while. Basically, you see, economic theory is a, a blinder, a blindfold. It makes it impossible to see reality. So my model kept telling me something and I just couldn't believe it, what it was saying because, uh, because the demand function satisfies this kind of property of uh, homogeneity of degree one. If all the prices and money are increased in the same proportion, then nothing changes in the real demand. This is exactly what, so this is what they say is the neutrality of money. But actually money is not neutral in this model, but it's a little bit subtle. Why? And it takes, um, so this is what uh, they claim, the neoclassical theorists, that uh, you can take the money out. Basically, money is a unit of account, but uh, it's a veil. You can just remove it. Uh, it's actually, things work without money just as well. It's completely false. Money is an essential ingredient in this model, and without money, you cannot do any of the calculations. And uh, by changing money, everything changes. <coughs> so there are two complications in this model. Both were noted by Keynes in his book, but... When I read it first, I couldn't understand what he was talking about. And both have been, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure whether the new classes understood and uh, hid it or whether they never managed to understand it. But anyway, it didn't make it into the 
textbooks. The Samuelson doesn't have any discussion of it. Samuelson says Keynes is very difficult to understand. So one complication is the complexity that if a property holds for an individual, it doesn't hold for the whole group. And so if money neutrality holds for one individual, it doesn't follow that it holds for the whole group. And the second property is that demand cannot be defined without nominal money and nominal prices. Demand function cannot be defined in terms of real money and real prices as they say. So the concept of real wage is meaningless. There is no such thing as a real wage. Okay, so that's just, now I'm going to explain it. So complexity is very easy. Suppose there are two groups in the population. One are bread lovers, so they have high alpha, and one is cloth lovers, and they have high beta. Suppose we double the amount of money in the system, but we give all the money to the bread lovers. Then the demand for bread will increase by a lot, and the demand for cotton will increase by a little bit, half of what it increases for the bread. So um, money is not neutral because it was given to the uh, one group. Similarly, if you double the money and give it to the cotton-loving group, then demand for cotton will double, but uh, demand for money will increase by 50%. Again, um, money is not neutral. Uh, it doesn't act in the same way. So just saying if you take the amount of money in an economy and you double it, all the prices will rise. This is wrong. But the hold of this illusion is so strong that people make policies on this basis. And recent uh, world history is an example. So what Keynes says is that you can use monetary policy to prevent recession and depression, which means that basically if you uh, demand is low, aggregate demand is low, you increase the amount of money, aggregate demand will rise, and then the factories will start going, as we said earlier. What Friedman said uh, in um, attacking Keynes is that it was not the failure of free markets. What Keynes said is that this is basically a failure of the free market system. But Friedman says that not the failure of free markets, the failure of the government. If the government did not uh, carry out the right monetary policy, um, money supply was too small, and that is what caused the Great Depression. So now, in this uh, global um, financial crisis, the people who were at the helm of the Federal Reserve were all followers of Friedman and Montres. So what they did was they generated a huge amount of money and they gave it to the banks. This is what quantitative easing was at 0% interest. The idea is that once money is available at 0% interest to the banks, then the banks will lend it to investors at very low interest rates and still make profit. And um, once they start investing in the economy, that will create jobs and demand and everything. So that will break up the recession. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that is correct, Chani. There is a contradiction here, which... They fix by talking about short run and long run, but there is no real fix that. In the short run, in the long run, you see what would happen if the money is short is that the prices would decline so that the amount of money you have becomes sufficient. But that process can take too long. So, But you are right, there is a contradiction. So Mia and Sufi in their, um, these are real economists, both Pakistanis of origin, House of Debt, which is a very important book about the global financial crisis, mm -hmm. They said that huge amounts of debt was taken to finance the mortgage loans and then there was a bubble process. Um, 
if you take a loan to buy a house, I mean that increases the demand for housing. So with increased demand, the prices rise, and when the prices rise, it becomes more attractive to buy houses because then the your your return is. So you people, more people take more loans and buy more houses, and that creates the bubble. It's a spiral. Now what happens is that. Uh, the reason for this bubble is the interest rate contracts plus insurance. When you have interest rate contracts, instead of musharka, then the banks have no interest in the outcome of what happens. I mean, if you, I give you a loan to buy a house, if the house price collapse, I'm not concerned. So, in fact, um, uh, if you are unable to pay back, I'm not concerned because the insurance will pay me. So, I'm only interested in making loans. So, that's what happened in the uh, finance. Okay? They would take any person coming off the street and say, okay, here's your loan. They would even go out and after, if you want to buy a house, we'll give you a loan. You go buy a house. So, um, actually, Yuan Sufi showed that if, we, if there was Musharka contracts, the bank would uh, uh, have an interest in the value of the house. The pay repayment would depend on the value of the house. Then there would have been no global financial crisis. The banks knew that the market is going to collapse. And they still kept making loans. They, they wanted to make the market collapse. So, why didn't investors borrow after this quantitative easing? Uh, to prevent the Great Recession which happened, which, is, which was even worse than the Great Depression according to some calculations. Because there were mountains of existing debt already, so they could not take more debt. <coughs> <coughs> the collapse of the mortgage market created even more debt. Um, there was a trillion dollar loan which the students are, uh, have acquired in the USA to finance their higher education which has been extremely expensive. Actually that's again another free market operation. The free market is everybody's out for money. So what the banks did was that they said that <coughs> we will provide loans to the students, the government should only guarantee these loans. So let the free market do it instead of the government doing it. <clears throat> and then um, they said the colleges, they, they said to the colleges that we can give lots of loans. So the students have lots of money now. So the colleges raised, started raising tuition massively and uh, everybody can pay because they borrow and basically the students end up uh, uh, mortgage for life. All they, they earn money, they, they get an education for four years and then they spend the rest of their life paying off their loan. Very interesting thing that the banks did was that <coughs> when they were making these laws, there's a bankruptcy law which says that, okay, if you declare that I have nothing left, then you get a free st uh, uh, slate that, okay, all your debts are wiped out and you start at zero. But the student loan cannot be written off in bankruptcy. It remains with you even if you are bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay off the bank um, even after you are bankrupt. So basically the banks have purchased the entire student population of the USA, all the poor ones, the rich ones pay, pay for their own. So <clears throat> what uh, aggregation does, it, it reveals the, it, it, it conceals the picture of what's really happening in an economy. So here's the uh, from 1974 onwards, where uh, basically the power of the free market, basically 1974 was the uh, oil crisis, after which the, uh, that was also the year when I was started my PhD program. And at that time, you, um, classical economics was very strong. Friedman school was the butt of jokes. Everybody said, these are quacks, these are not real economies, these are, uh, this is an ideology. But after the oil crisis uh, in the USA, where the USA actually attacked uh, Egypt on the side of Israel, 
then the um, Arab states put an embargo of oil on the USA to retaliate for this. So uh, energy prices rose in the USA. Uh, that led to inflation, cost push inflation. Uh, so the Keynesian inflation is actually demand pull inflation and this in terminology is invented around that time to explain. But the Friedman group, they had been preparing this theory for two decades to find a, they, and they were looking for a crisis and as soon as this crisis came out, oh, see this proves, you see they had, what they had was uh, increasing inflation at the same time unemployment. Now, according to a Keynesian theory, you can have one or the other, you can't have both. So, see, this proves that Keynes is wrong, even though it doesn't, because actually what the type of inflation that Keynes was talking about was uh, demand pull. And the type of inflation that occurred was different. But they, they were just looking for an excuse, and they found this excuse, and everybody else was confused, so they managed to seize the advantage. This is called disaster capitalism. You take advantage of a disaster to impose your ideology. So once this um, Friedman group took hold and, and um, um, soon after I think um, er, uh, late 70s or early 80s you had Reagan-Thatcher revolution. Both of these were free market ideologues. This oil crisis created this um, recession in the western economies and they said, oh, the solution, the reason for this uh, re re recession is financial regulation. The financial regulation had been put in place after the Great Depression to prevent the Great Depression and to prevent crisis. And it had done a wonderful job. For 50 years <laughs> after the Great Depression, there were no banking crises. O uh, occasionally, one or two banks would fail, but... <coughs> Uh, there were lots of, any, all of the uh, Keynesian economics also had the effect that the uh, bottom 50% had an increasing share of income, which is not shown here. <coughs> and the top 1% had a declining share. So it, it controlled a lot of things. Uh, and it led to prosperity in all of uh, Europe and uh, America for about 50 years from the... But this prosperity of the masses was uh, the poverty of the top 1% and they didn't like it and they had the power. So they changed the ideology and they said all of the problem is due to Keynesian economics. Just like today Trump is saying all of the problems in the American economy are due to terrorism and Muslim, uh, Muslim immigrants even though it has nothing to do with their economic problems. So you find convenience keep good. So what happened as a result of this uh, uh, takeover of Chicago market econom uh, economics? You can see uh, the red line is the share of the top 1%. It's going up like a rocket. <coughs> the green line is the share of the bottom 15%, 50% and it's going down. Uh, it went from 22% to 12%, becoming nearly half, while the um, share of the top 1% doubled. So basically economic theory is designed to prevent you from seeing reality. It doesn't mention the all of the important things which drive the economy. So for example, economic theory says that debt doesn't matter. There's no mention of debt because they say it's a cancelling transaction. Somebody has debt and the other person has the money. So if you aggregate the money, it's zero. So the reality is that if the middle class has the debt, then there is no aggregate demand. If the rich people have debt, then um, uh, it doesn't matter. Actually, what uh, Mia and Sufi show is that in the um, there was a dot-com bubble in 1999 uh, and that bubble burst and they show that the amount of value lost was like a huge trillion dollar loss but it didn't have any impact on the economy. Why? Because in the dot-com bubble only the rich people were involved. 
The rich people gained a trillion in speculation and lost a trillion and nobody noticed the difference. But in the um, GFC, the middle class had a trillion dollar invested in houses and when they lost, then the economy went down. So debt, according to economic theory, doesn't matter. It's never mentioned. You don't even um, have any category in macroeconomics. Macro there's no mention of debt. There's no mention of money. There's no mention of banks. Uh, as a result, today the top 13 people own more wealth than the bottom 3.5 billion. They have more than half the money of all the world. Economics have disappeared the debt, just like they disappeared the land that we discussed. Saving glut. glut. Is there a global saving guy? I don't know about it. That is the US economy saving a lot of debt. Actually, this, is, this debt is a misleading debt. description of what is going on. Actually, what happens is that. Chinese are exporting a lot and they're the uh, debtors, largest debtors. The US is, and they're importing a lot and their current account is increasing. That is expanding over the years. The, actually, this has to do with money creation, which is another issue. We will discuss that later. Uh, but some of this is explained in the Mian Sufi book very clearly. Okay, so here is the <coughs> situation which <coughs> uh, plot by in uh, um, in the Amir and Sufi book. I have taken it from there, which explains why debt matters even though conventional theory says that that doesn't matter. So this is the housing, home ownership by quintal. So if you look at the black line, that is the amount of debt that the people take to buy the house. So, um, and then there is the uh, top line gray, that is the amount of money that they put down cash. And the gray line, that is the equity, which means that after you buy the house, and you pay installments for a while, then the uh, you have value of house. Uh, some ha a house has a certain amount of value, which which belongs to you actually. <clears throat> so now, what happens in a in a uh, when you have a collapse is what he talks about is extreme injustice. That basically what happens is that the bank first takes all your money. Then it takes all your equity. And he, the loss is not shared equally between the two parties. Suppose the house price collapses and becomes 50%. Then in the Musharka contract, both parties lose 50% of what they had. Now instead, in what happens in a conventional mortgage is that the weaker party, the poor person who had to borrow, he loses everything. The richer party loses nothing. So... Um, as a result, basically all of the savings of the middle class, which they had put in as down payments or as installments, was wiped out in one blow. And so uh, aggregate demand collapsed. So, so just like the uh, neoclassical economics disappears the land and it disappears the debt, it also disappears the money because it teaches you that money doesn't matter. Money is a veil. Actually, I've said that the theory that money is a veil is a veil to cover the truth. <laughs> money doesn't matter if there's only one agent, as we have seen. But, uh, or if there's a representative agent, because then means you take that one agent and you replicate in RBC models, real business cycle, there's only one agent. Money is neutral. Banks don't matter. Who creates money doesn't matter. Debt doesn't, can't exist because there's only one man who is going to, who is going to give the loan to. The greatest mystery of all is how can intelligent people believe in such nonsense? It's like, it's amazing. Solo testimony. So um, after the uh, global financial crisis, even the stupid people in Congress decided that there is something wrong with economics. I mean, even they realized this. 
So they said that, okay, let's make a committee to find out why economic theory didn't succeed in predicting this crisis. So as a whole testimony, building the science of economics for the real world or something like that. And so a lot of uh, heavy-duty economists were called to uh, give testimony. So Solo, uh, he wrote about how the DSGE model, the dynamic structure, which is the major model currently in use in Pakistan and all over the world, is, uh, is the cause for the crisis. He says the DSG model has a simplified economy with exactly one per agent. This agent is both the worker and he is the owner and he is the consumer and he is the planner. He plans ahead what is going to happen. He is the supercomputer which calculates everything and he lives forever. So one important consequence of this representative agent is there are no conflicts of interest. No uh, two people with different expectations, no deception, no fraud, which was the cause. There can't be. There's only one person who's going to deceive. So that's what he said why there was. Uh, that the, you, If you use this model, you, you are systematically blind to everything that can create the crisis. That's why the economists were flabbergasted. But the question is, how can you be so stupid? This is something I don't understand, really, even though I have explanations. So here are some people who, um, some very serious, heavy-duty, big, practical, practicing economists. Narayana Kocherlakota, I think that's an Indian name, was the president of Minneapolis Federal Reserve. He said that economists build toy models. It's like, not real models, they're just toys. And he says, we simply don't have a successful theory. He says that, you know, in order to create a model, you have to have a theory on which you build the model. But we don't have a theory. So there can't be any serious model because if we have a theory, so then we can build a model. So Olivier Blanchard, very famous economist, IMF chief, he said that DSG models play a dominant role in research. Everybody is using these. But they are a dangerous dead end. They are based on assumptions which are not just wrong, but they are profoundly at odds. They are completely opposite of what we know about consumers and firms. Paul Romer, famous neoclassical economist, he just wrote recently. He was trained at Chicago under uh, Lucas, the leader of the uh, Chicago school. So he said that more, for more than three decades, macroeconomics has gone backward. So, basically, why does do business cycles take place? This is the fundamental question of macro. When I was in uh, in graduate school, this was the uh, we were uh, the course was called business cycle theory. Why do we have fluctuations in macroeconomics? When basically the classical theory says that you should have equilibrium, you should have full employment continuously. So how can employment fluctuate? This is the question which Keynes starts with. So. The RBC model, well, basically the um, correct explanation is it has to do with money and money creation. This is what the Minsky, Hyman Minsky, this is what his uh, explanation is. So when you take out all money, debt, banks and loans, then you are stuck. How can you, your model? So then you introduce these random errors. So people ask, what are these random errors? Well, it's just noise. So he said that it's like you can say that there's phlogiston and there's gremlins. These are things which are imaginary quantities and they are driving the economy. They are the only things which can cause change. Otherwise, the real model, nothing changes. The number of employers, the number of job, uh, factories, everything. All of the real factors remain the same, but you are having fluctuations. Why? Well, there are these gremlins that come in and uh, change the economy. So... What we have is that neutrality, there seems to be neutrality in money for one individual. For a while I uh, didn't understand this. But actually even for one individual we don't have neutrality. It, that's a little bit subtle. But definitely it doesn't hold in the aggregate for the whole economy. The prices matter. Quantity theory doesn't hold. Economists in the USA, New Classical, were very surprised by what happened after quantitative easing because... Uh, trillions of dollars were pumped into the economy. So, 
according to economists, inflation should have gone skyrocketing, but nothing happened to inflation. In fact, the um, this is one of the charts that Atif Mia and Sufi also put in that money doesn't behave in this way that <coughs> prices are proportional. So how does it behave? There is this guy called Richard Werner. He has developed the quantity theory credit, which explains exactly how money behaves, fits the observations very well, rejects the quantity theory of money. Nobody has heard of him. Why? Because the theory is against the uh, mainstream ideology. Uh, the Nobel Prize was given to these people who had like Lucas, Lucas was the early tha, pehle, ha, Fama, who was actually responsible for the global financial crisis in the sense that he argued that the stock market prices are rational. So when people were worried that stock market is overheating, they said that no, it's rational. It can't be overheating. In fact, um, one of those people said that it's in, bubbles are impossible by definition because the price is always... The market price is always right, so the idea that the market price is above the genuine price is meaningless because market price is by definition the right price. So economists were very surprised by reality as they always are. The second big surprise, this is something which again Keynes said and again I didn't understand when I read Keynes but in the context of this model, when I constructed it, then I came to the understanding that. See, if you look at the demand function, it is only well defined in nominal terms. It cannot be defined in terms of real money. Because basically in demand function, we say keep the income constant and change the price. Now this can be done if you have money income and money price. <laughs> then you can say, okay, I keep the Money income same and I change the price, what will happen to the demand? But suppose you say okay, keep the real income the same and change the real price, this cannot be done because there is no such thing as real money. Because real money, to define it, you need a price deflator. But in the economic system, when you change prices, everything changes. The amount of uh, thing that you are consuming, the amount of bread you consume, amount of bread. So what's you going to be your uh, basket of goods which will have the price? As you change the price, this basket will change. So basically real money cannot be defined. So Borjas in his labor theory says that labor is set marginal disability of labor equal to the real wage and he is surprised by how strongly Empirical evidence contradicts the theory because the theory is completely wrong. So, many things which are hidden in economic theory because you only have one agent and you're doing all these calculations all the time and not, not uh, you are not given any chance to think because the assumptions are made are already so complicated that you can't understand them. Contrary to the basic principle of modeling that you should make simple models to try to understand. So, um, one of the hypotheses that we have is that economists use one agent model deliberately because that's the only way you can hide everything that's happening. Otherwise, if you put in two agents, suddenly one of them can be poor and one of them can be rich. And that's exactly, that's uh, what Karl Marx said, was the laborers are... Uh, different type and capitalists are, and, and we have this in our model. The landlords are different and the laborers are different and they have different types of rules of behavior. So, uh, it is really surprising why economists have been deceived, but why should we follow suit? We, we can learn the reality. We don't have to follow whatever we learn from the Western textbooks and um, there is this book Confessions of an Economic Hitman which says, explains how they use economic theories to deceive the third world leaders into following harmful 
uh, policies. It's happening all the time, even today. So, coming back to the demand model, we have all agents buy three units of bread and after that they split the remaining income roughly half and half between bread and cloth. So equal budget share for food and clothing. For the issues that we plan to study, the heterogeneity is not important. So we assume all agents are the same. They all do half and half. Because for, for the things that I want to look at, this doesn't matter. In other contexts, you might want to do different things. So how complicated you, model, you make the model depends on what you, what you are trying to understand. And we should use the simplest possible model which captures the phenomena. This is Ibn al Haysam's principle, which in the West they called Occam's razor. But they never understood what Occam's razor is and why it is there. They say, okay, the simplest model, but the simplest model need not be true. And in fact, many times uh, they have understood that the simplest model is, is not a good model. Like the Ptolemy's model is a simple model, circle, doesn't work. And many other. Uh, Newton's model is much simpler than Einstein's model, but so models are not meant to be reality, they are meant to help us understand reality. That's why you have to keep them simple. Once you start with a simple model and you understand it, and then you see the mismatch, then you adjust the model, make it more complicated to match. And by that, in a sequence of steps, you can arrive at understanding more and more complicated things. And that's why you start with simple models. It doesn't have to do with what Occam understood. It has to do with what Ibn al Haysam understood. So, <coughs> there's again something which Keynes said that money is not neutral in the short run and in the long run. What uh, Friedman, etc., says that money is active in the short run, but it is neutral in the long run. And that's how you explain this contradiction, although it doesn't really explain it. But <clears throat> <clears throat> so, now, if you think about the principle that the real wage is the marginal product of labor, <clears throat> at one t uh, in one sense it makes a lot of sense. And in fact, Keynes accepts this principle. He says there are two principles. One is the supply of labor, that he rejects. And the um, demand for labor, that's one he accepts. So, uh, the, the point is that you hire a laborer and he produces something. So, what you pay to him should be uh, coming out of this. It should be less than what you earn. As if you are... Uh, if you pay him more than his marginal product, then basically it means that you are subsidizing, I mean, you are making a loss by hiring him. So, for a profit-making firm, it doesn't make sense. But, what is the marginal product of labor? Here, in our model, uh, uh, in, according to parameters that I will discuss soon, uh, the last laborer will produce five units. It can be either wheat or cotton or any combination of the two goods. So the value of the marginal pro product depends on prices if you want to calculate it in money terms. <coughs> Again, uh, if you look at the wage, what will compare, if you think about the new classical, how much wage, how much money do I need to earn to compensate for the disutility of labor? Well. I need to think about what I can buy with this wage in order to understand the value of money. But the value of money depends on the prices, <coughs> and the prices depend on the system, and actually you cannot know what the prices are. <coughs> so, uh, it's sort of uh, impossible informationally for the laborer to set uh, money wage equal to ut this utility. So, basically we follow rules of thumb. We work and then Actually, lots of people work huge amounts, some people work nothing for the same amount of wage at the same job. So, real wage cannot be defined because there is no 
bundle of goods, which is the same. If some one laborer prefers wheat and the price of wheat is high, then the same amount of money is worth less for him. The other one prefers cloth and cloth is cheap. Same amount of money is worth more. So if the wages are the same, then they cannot be equal to both people's marginal utility. So the whole idea is such just impossible to implement. So when we look at demand and supply, we can only define them in nominal terms, not in real terms. Money matters essentially, both in long run and in short run. Index number problem cannot be solved. And there is massive interaction between demand and supply. You can't draw the two curves in isolation because they both interact with each other. So we come to now the supply model. So the landlords hire labor. We know what the marginal product is in terms of the physical good production, but we don't know the value of this marginal product in terms of prices. And normally, as uh, Keynes said also, the reality, you have to pay wages in advance and then at the end of the period you get the production and then you sell the goods and then you realize what the marginal product was. So at the time you're hiring, you don't know what the marginal product is because the product that's going to be produced has unknown price. So how do we calculate the marginal product of labor? We can't. So this is again, this is not possible. But uh, I'm going to <coughs> try to match the neoclassical by making certain assumptions and I'll show you how it's done. So in the model that in the paper I have uh, um, done the calculations and here I'm trying to show the structure of the model without doing the calculation just so that you can understand the model. In fact, it's easier to understand the model without doing the calculation because when you start doing calculation then you become confused between the cal calculation and the model. And what's important is to understand the structure of the model, not the calculations. Calculations you can feed to the computer. And that's how you should do it. That's what the net logo languages are, that you tell them what the behavior is of the landlord and you tell them how the structure, and then let the computer do the calculation, what will happen. So we assume MPL is 11 units of production for the first seven. So you get to 77 and then you decline st steadily. So uh, next uh, one is 9 and then it's 7 and then it's 5 at 10. That's what I wanted. 5 marginal products at 10 because 10 is going to be the equilibrium. <coughs> so it goes to 3 at 11 and 1 at uh, 12 and then 0. So the 13th laborer doesn't add anything. You have the same uh, so there is no random variation and you can split productivity equally between cotton and wheat. Actually, all of these, yani, uh, we don't, yani, this is to make things easy. Otherwise, in real models, things might be more complicated. So in order to get closest to neoclassical, we need to know the price of the products. If I want to calculate the marginal product, I need to know what the price is. The price will be what the price will be after the crop comes in and nobody knows that. We don't know how much grain will be produced. We don't know what the international market conditions will be. Everything keeps fluctuating routinely. Um, it's completely unpredictable. But in order to get a solution, what I will assume is that the government announces support prices. Notice that this is not going to happen in a free market. So, it's sort of contradictory. Uh, what uh, Lucas guy and these people do is they say that people can forecast accurately what's going to happen. So, people go to them and say, look, our best econometricians can't do a forecasting. They have all the data. And these poor people, <laughs> they don't have any data. They don't how are we going to forecast. So, it's the magic of the market. So what I'm going to do in order to get uh, something close to uh, neoclassical is that I'm going to assume we're looking at a small village which has 10 lords and 100 laborers and this is a small village which is near a big city. So in the big city there's a big market 
So one of the things is that the village production has no impact on aggregate supply. So the price is not going to be affected. The standard competitive theory fairy tale. And also I'm going to assume frictionless trading. So you can buy cotton at 10 and you can sell cotton at 10. Again, this is neoclassical fairy tale. So now what will happen? What will the production decision be? In this situation, production decision is irrelevant because um, you're assuming that both things are equally priced for the moment. I will change that a little bit later. So in that case, uh, at equal prices, uh, if they are equal prices, then you produce arbitrary. You, whether you produce bread or cotton doesn't matter because you can sell it at 10 and get back the other thing at 10. So whatever you produce, you can trade it for whatever you want. So your production is irrelevant. You can produce all cotton, all bread, mix, whatever you like, as long as you produce it's the same. But if the price of bread is higher a little bit, you will produce all bread. If the price of cotton is higher a little bit, you will produce all cotton. So, uh, MPL, now we can calculate if I know the price of bread and cotton, which I have done by assumption. Either you can forecast it by Lucas or you can, um, or the government has announced it, so you know. In that case, you can calculate the MPL. So, uh, the tenth laborer will produce five units. If the price of cotton and bread is the same, then the MPL is five times the price of bread. Uh, otherwise, it's the five times. The, if the price of cotton is higher, then it's five times the price of cotton. And so that's what you should hire the labor for. But actually, we will see that this doesn't happen. Uh, so now we put in a friction. This will happen if you have actually exactly new classical assumption. You can go to the city and come back without any uh, expense. And you can buy at a cotton uh, a store uh, at 10 and you can repurchase at 10. All of this is just fairy tale. It doesn't happen in the real world. So we put in just a little bit of friction. Say, okay, 10% difference. If you um, go and sell cotton in the city, just going and coming back costs you one per unit, which means that you actually realize nine rupees. And if you want to go and purchase cotton in the city, then you have to pay 11. 10 is the price and then one dollar is for friction cost. So it turns out that there is a large menu, large literature on menu costs. You see, people ask that the um, prices of inputs keep fluctuating. Uh, today, every day we have the price of chicken is higher, price of beef is lower, but the restaurant menus are the same. So what is happening there? Marginal costs should be fluctuating every day. They should. So they say, okay, it takes a price to print the menu. So to change the menu requires more. Uh, now this is a false explanation actually. <laughs> People put down boards and prices and it's not costly. That is not the explanation, but this is the explanation. So with small amount of friction, uh, it turns out that when you go away from exact maximization of profits to approximate maximum, then things change dramatically, drastically. Because what turns out in, in many problems, you have what is called a near flat maximum. Here's the maximum point, and then the near that, there's a long area which is approximately maximum. So if you say just instead of exact maximum, you can do something very different and still come quite close to the maximum. So then there's not control of what, you cannot predict what will happen if you say people are approximate maximizers instead of exact. So they have, uh, this in this literature, a lot of different phenomena which happen are explained by saying that, okay, instead of exactly maximizing, you go to approximate. And many phenomena, new kinds of phenomena emerge which have no names so, as, so that you cannot think about them in conventional economics. So we have to expand our ways of thinking because um, what economics does is it um, hides things. Like what, what is the, uh, what one thing that comes out is that prices will never be fixed at one value. 
So when you want to talk about prices, you have to talk about a distribution of prices. Prices are randomly distributed around some quantity. And so that's the right way to think about what will happen in the market. It's not, there's no one equilibrium price. There can be an equilibrium distribution, but there cannot be an equilibrium single price. And that's what we observe in reality. So, but there's no concept for this in economics. So suppose that the city prices are that price of bread is 9.99 cents and uh, uh, price of cotton is 10.01. So every landlord hires 10 laborers. Marginal uh, product of labor is 5 units of production. Wage is 50.05. Doesn't really matter. Only cotton is produced because cotton is more expensive. Right? Uh, we want to pay about 500 units of production as wages because um, there are a total of 100 laborers. Each one is paid 5 units of production. I am not converting it to prices yet. Total production is 980. That you can calculate by going back to the table. Um, 98 units was the amount that you achieved at 10 laborers and there are 10 landlords. So there is 980. So now the laborer demand is three bread plus one bread plus one cloth. So four breads and one cloth. And there are a hundred of them. So four hundred breads and hundred cloth. Landlord demand, we assume they have the same utility function. So uh, they have pr produced 980. They pay 500 to the wages. So they have 480, 48 each. <coughs> Among them, they uh, uh, want 30 units of bread for minimum consumption. And uh, the remaining 450 is split into half, 225 for bread and 225 for cotton. This is approximately what the solution should be. So, if we look at the village demand and supply, village demand for bread is 400 plus 225, 255, 655. And the uh, village demand for cotton is um, 100 plus 225. It's 325. So, now, the problem is that village is in surplus in cotton. You have 980 units of uh, cotton which was produced and only 655 is demanded <coughs> within the village. So, you can pay villagers in um, cotton units and uh, you can pay yourself in cotton units, you retain cotton. But um, basically 655, that the total de village demand is 325 and you produce 980, so you have 655 units of surplus. Now for this, this is what you want, everybody wants bread for. So you go to the, uh, to the city, you sell it, you sell it at 9, you buy bread at uh, 11. So you suffer 20% loss on each unit. So basically you end up with uh, 320 units of bread instead of 400, that's 20% from off from 400. And the laborers get only 205 units of bread, which is again, uh, their, their demand was 225. So uh, actually so it would be more, uh, it would be 175 something. No, no, two, 255 was the, yeah, 255 was the landlord demand for bread and they lose 20%, so about 25 is 10%, so 50 is subtracted. So you end up losing about 20% of the produce in the friction cost. This is not good when there is no need and the, the village has the capacity to produce 655 units of bread and 325 units of cotton. And if they did that, then everybody would be happy. They can trade at 10 and everybody, and there would be no loss. This 20% uh, uh, loss, which is about 120 un 130 units of production is being lost by traveling to the city, uh, selling your cotton and buying bread and bringing it back when you could have done it yourself. But the main problem, and this is very important, is that there are no signals 
which we, which can tell the landlord that you have to produce 655 units of of uh, bread and 355 units of cotton uh, the price cannot give this information about to the landlord how much bread should you produce and how much cotton should you produce oops this is contrary to the fundamental theorems of economic theory the most important the big lesson of all of economics is that you can decentralize production by prices so once i announce the prices then every agent solves his own separate maximization problem the uh, consumers maximize their uh, utility subject to the budget constraint the firms maximize their profit subject to the uh, costs now there is no way that setting up of the setting up this problem in a, in a way that the landlords will produce 655 and the laborers will produce 325 it can't be done so basically this whole course uh, is supposed to teach you general equilibrium theory the outcome of general equilibrium theory is that there exists a price uh, set of prices at which the market creates a decentralized efficient outcome this theorem is wrong in this economy because there is no there doesn't exist any sequence of prices which which will uh, give the signals which allow everyone to do separate maximization and uh get to the maximum somehow this is not the um, i had some more slides but anyway uh no problem uh so actually i um wrote this paper some time ago uh no journal would publish it because <laughs> they can't even publish um, very simple things uh, this is a very uh, attack at the heart that the main thing which is taught in courses in general is is wrong uh it turns out that if you go back how does this general how do they create then there's a how do they create general equilibrium well they make a lot of artificial assumptions which are simply wrong in order to arrive at this result if you look at i mean i've i've done it i was studied general equilibrium in in uh, graduate school so you make one assumption after another assumption these are all technical assumptions math this is a upper semi continuous function and this is that and the, there's convexity and there's ala bala nobody ever tells you what this means you just keep making assumptions as if assumptions are for free you can assume whatever you like <laughs> and that is why there's this famous joke about the economists that there was this tin can and economists were in desert island and trying to uh, open it so the geologists went to look for rock formations which could be used to open the can and the engineer looked for uh, a lever and the economist just assumed it was open and he ate it up <laughs> <laughs> this is this is how it happens so now um one uh, issue that i wrote about in the um there are several things that happen in this model which have no match to what the economic theory says one of the things is suppose now this has, situation has occurred a uh, landlord has uh, produced 985 units of cotton and now uh, they are uh, the uh, laborer says give me 500 uh, rupees so now it's very difficult i mean for the landlord to give rupees he has to go and sell this cotton at 9 rupees which is less than the market price so he would rather pay the laborer in kind <laughs> he would rather pay cotton you say okay here you take this cotton and count it as 10 rupees because that's what the market price is in the city but uh so the question that i want to ask is 
Suppose that cotton is traded, sold in the market in the village. What will the price of cotton be? This is the fundamental question of value theory. What is the value of cotton in this village? Now there is excess of excess of cotton, and cotton can be purchased at eleven, so that's the maximum value, and it can be sold for nine in the village. So this is the minimum possible value, because anybody who has cotton he can get nine rupees for it. Anybody who wants to get cotton, he can get eleven. He can buy it for eleven. So this is the bound. Now, what is the exact price of cotton going to be? <coughs> That's the value of cotton in the village. So, what is the answer to this question? What is the value of cotton going to be? Well, as you see, the landlord will be paying, and he will say, "Okay, here's the cotton, and uh, I count this, and he, I'm supposed to pay you." Fifty rupees. Uh, landlord only wants one unit of cotton; doesn't want more. So, other so he can't give him five units of cotton. Otherwise, he would be very happy to do that. He says, "Okay, I'll give you one unit of cotton. You should count that as ten rupees, and I will pay you the remaining forty rupees by selling cotton in the city." So, the laborer can say that, "Look, if you sold the, I just give me the whole thing in rupees. I don't want cotton." So then, um, uh, uh, if you do that, then he says, "Okay, it will cost you nine rupees if you sell." So your cotton is actually only worth nine. So, okay, you can. I, I will allow you nine rupees and ten pesa, or nine and a quarter. So you can, um, you can. You don't have to go to the city, but nine a quarter is a fair price because you are getting nine in the city and eleven. But the landlord also has a different argument. What is the landlord's argument? Yeah. Ah. Uh, suppose I give you rupee. You are going to have buy, have to buy one cotton anyway. You will buy buy it for eleven. So I will sell it to you for ten fifty. I mean, I will give you the cotton. So you you will make a profit. So you should count this unit of cotton that I am paying you at ten fifty. So now the this is exactly the question of the theory of value what determines the value of this cotton so what is going to determine is, is it the amount of labor embedded in the cotton no that has nothing to do with it anymore how is the value going to be determined now use your brains i mean you are human beings what will happen <laughs> in this situation in reality Exactly, whoever has more power, normally the landlord has more power. So landlord can say that we will count this cotton at eleven rupees, which is what it will cost you. But it is not just power. In fact, power is also determined by social norms. So if everybody agrees that since the price of uh, cotton is uh, 10 rupees in the city the fair price for cotton should be 10 in the village as well then the landlords will be unable to break this consensus unless they start preaching free market ideology if they succeed in saying that whatever you can get for your uh, product that is the price this is what this is what is the um, the theory of you see before the new classical theory there was a theory of the just price the fair price and actually this is a very important concept even now the just price and the fair price make a difference in terms of how much we pay for goods uh, lots of uh, literature on this so but the economists say there is the just price fair price is meaningless if you are willing to pay me and i am willing to sell then that is uh, both people are willing so it's obviously the just and fair price so if somebody is wife is dying and he uh, uh, are in the hospital and he needs to raise uh, money for the uh, treatment and he has a car and he says okay i need 1 lakh rupees right now the car is worth 5 lakhs but um I need one lakh cash right away. Can you sell it? Okay, so he says, okay, I'll I'll give you one lakh because I'm making four lakhs. So, according to the economic theory, this is a fair transaction, but according to Islamic theory, it's not. 
you cannot take advantage of the uh, sudden need of somebody to cheat him. So, uh, the concept of the fair price plays a role in determining. So, basically, as I said in the earlier lecture about the theory of value, that there are some technical limits to the value. If the cost of production is a certain thing, then it cannot be, the price cannot go below that. And again, if the cotton is freely available at 11, it cannot go above that. But between those two limits, there is uh, um, social norms determined. What is the habitual? I mean, if, the, if in the village it has always been 950, then it will be 950, even if it is 10 in the city. Uh, every, as long as everybody, social norm is determined by consensus. If everybody agrees to something, then that is what it will be. Now, if there is a fight, if the people have disagreement, then power will come in. Then uh, if the uh, laborers say, uh, say something and the landlord say something else, then the relative power of the two parties will determine. But before power, we have uh, social consensus. All right. Now, there are many different aspects of this model, which um, we can explore. And as I said, models are simple. Uh, you study how humans should behave and um, in the situation, and you find the answer. You don't uh, make equations to calculate. So, um, I will give you some exercises in connection with this model. I didn't have time to write them up. So I will write them up and circulate them by email as usual. Um, uh, we can stop this and 